post. All right. I'm I'm recording this. this. Um, I will record it, and we Thank will you. figure out what to do with that yeah, recording much. later. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, but what I did think would be helpful for the folks on the um, – on this call today before we kind of dive into Q&A is just to kind of, you know, we released four different documents with the announcement of kind of grant availability. And I thought I'd just kind of walk through and be like, what's on this document? So you know what to expect as you're going through it and how to kind of think about filling out the application. Um, uh, we've made a lot of changes to this round of application really to make it a lot easier uh, to submit applications for standard project types. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, with that, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, you'll notice in the chat, I've pasted links to all of these documents, so you, you can access them from there. Um, and let me share my screen. All right. <clears throat> Are you guys able to see that? So all can, okay, great. Okay, so I'll start in the kind of order and uh, that I've pasted them in the chat. Uh, we wanted to start with just a very brief document describing like what are all of the different technical assistance grant programs that we have at DLCD. So folks know like, well, if I have this project type, really what pool of funding should I apply for? When is that application process going to be roughly? What is it for? You know, how much money is available? And so we kind of got this short document together just describing all of those things. Um, this includes all of the housing planning assistance that we're aware of, including um, the, the things we'll be talking about today. But we also wanted to include, like, our, we have a general TA program that's for things that are not related to housing. We have the TGM program, you know, all those different types of things. So if you're wondering about, like, which um, pot of funding or application process is going to best suit my project, this is definitely the document to refer to. Highly recommend just taking a read, about, read through it if you have a minute. Um, and one one of the things I'll mention, so we're going to be talking about housing related planning assistance. Um, and we know uh, based on um, what has been passed by the legislature so far, we can for certain say that we have been allocated three point five million dollars for the purpose of housing planning through House Bill 2001, which has passed this legislative session. That includes two and a half million for housing planning assistance. This is, you know, anything related to goal 10, including, you know, like things like housing production strategies. And then we also have a pot of funding of about a million dollars for anything related to urbanization. So um, for folks who might have identified a need for a UGB amendment or want to pursue a UGB land exchange or want to adopt urban reserves or, you know, want to do some um, uh, public facilities planning in relationship to an expansion area to make it development ready. Uh, we have essentially a pot of funding that's dedicated to that. That's actually very new, that we have not had that before. One of the things I wanted to mention, in addition to these two pots of funding, the legislative session is not over, right? We're starting this early to give as much time for projects as possible, but that means there's a lot of pot of funding, pots of funding that are in discussion right now that we don't exactly know if they're going to be adopted or not. So in addition to this, we have seen some technical assistance floating around for a lot of things related to code amendments uh, and things like that. So they're tentative at this time, so we didn't include them on the sheet, but just keep in mind that there might be a, a, a bunch of additional funding. So we highly encourage just submitting projects. I would definitely encourage if you have a code amendment project that you know kind of needs to happen in your community, we highly encourage uh, applying for that. All right, so that's the first document. Um, I'm going to move to the second document. We can take questions at the end. Um, and I'm going to move into this, this uh, what we have been calling our kind of grant packet. This is a six-page document. I would highly encourage just taking a read through this. This describes uh, what the housing planning kind of assistance dollars are for. It describes, you know, the legislative context. It describes what our funding priorities are, how we're going to be making decisions, who can apply for grants, what the timelines are looking like, all of the information that you want to know about the grant program is outlined in detail in this document. So I highly encourage taking a read of that, but I won't spend too much time on it here today. All right, I'm going to move to the application form. This is the thing that you submit to us to say that, hey, we want to funding and assistance. And we've made some changes to this document since last biennium. And the major change is that we designed this to be more like a fillable form that you complete and then you submit to us rather than having to submit a bunch of attachments. There's some asterisks to that, which I'll explain in a minute. So this form is designed to be, you know, fillable. You can kind of enter in all of the relevant information in here. 
And one of the major changes that we're doing this biennium to make this a little bit easier for folks to fill out is we've designed uh, and, and developed a set of scopes of work, which I'll talk about it's in the next document, for standardized project types. So like, for example, a housing production strategy, largely between cities, there might be some differences in how they approach the project, but the major deliverables and the tasks are roughly going to look the same between city to city. So we developed this kind of book of sample work programs, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, of just kind of standardized project types. And one of the major changes is if a city, oftentimes cities are just want a particular product, they know exactly what it is, it, it's going to look very similar to what other product types look like. If they are proposing one of those standard project types, they don't have to submit a detailed scope of work to us. They can just check a box, right, indicating which project that they want. And when they're submitting an application to us, um, similar to kind of last biennium, we're offering two different types of assistance. One is for direct grants. This is just us giving you money with a grant agreement in place. And this is to either pay your staff to do work or you can hire a consultant and do an RFP process to, to onboard them. And we are also providing a bench of DLCD provided consultants similar to the last two biennia. This enables us to manage the contract and have a bench of consultants that we can provide to cities so they don't have to do the RFP and manage the contract themselves. Um, I know there's a few consultants in the room here today. We will be eventually releasing an RFP for this. We actually have it completed. We are running into some administrative hurdles with the Department of Administrative Services. So we would expect this to be happening sometime early this summer, but we, we need to work through some backlogs that, that are holding us up there. But we expect to have some DLCD provided consultants. Um, I think the only other thing I would mention about this uh, this is designed so that you can fill the application and submit it, but there are a few attachments that you might need to provide depending on what your project looks like. One is uh, we wanted to leave the option available for cities who really want to do a very specialized or custom bespoke project to be able to submit them to us, but we need to know what the details of that project are. So if you're going to propose a very customized bespoke project, we're going to need a detailed work program right, where you kind of outline, all right, what are all of the tasks, timelines, what's the purpose of this project, X, Y, Z, right? So that way, you know, you have that flexibility to provide it, but we'll need more detail and information. So it'll be a little bit harder to complete. And then in addition to that, there's one more thing you'll need to attach. And we don't need it by the grant deadline, but we will need it before we execute an agreement with you, which we need to know that your councils or commissions are on board with the project. And we need that through an adopted resolution saying, yes, we support the project. And that would be an attachment that you submit to us at some point. There's more details on and instructions on how to actually complete the form that are in the form itself. Highly encourage taking a read and of course, you know, letting us know if you have any questions. Um, but that's kind of the major change from last biennium. It's really intended to be a much more straightforward form that you fill out rather than kind of all of these detailed application materials that you need to prepare. All right, and then lastly, I mentioned that we have all of these sample work programs. Uh, this is this document, it's, a, it's about 31 pages. We don't expect you to read the entirety of this, but we would ask that if you're you know, proposing a specific project type, give a look at the sample work program and make sure it roughly aligns with your expectations. So like if you, let's say for example, want to do a housing production strategy, this biennium, Take a look at the housing. Notice I have bookmarks in the document so you can easily get to the project type. So it's that, that should be a little bit easier. Just take a, a look at the, you know, the purpose as well as the tasks and make sure it looks roughly about what you expect. The details might be different. You might want different kind of public meetings or different meetings with your council or planning commission. That's okay. We can edit this program later on, but just make sure that the major tasks and deliverables roughly align with your expectations, right? And if you want to do something very custom and bespoke, we'll need a detailed work program. That's the only kind of caveat here. So with that, that's kind of just an overview of what those four documents contain. Happy to talk through any questions that you guys might have. I know some of you have probably already been reviewing these already. And yeah, happy to dive into it. And I, I guess also housing team members or regional reps, let me know if you have any questions or, or if there's anything I missed. The only thing I would just add is that the application period opened June 1st and closes July 31st. So, Shauna, I don't know if you said that, uh, just some important dates there. Uh, but we do have a question from Morgan.
Sorry, that was a uh, that was supposed to be a direct message. <laughs> I did have a question about um, uh oh about criteria for the code uh, code development grant. Yeah, um, about um, criteria. Uh, so do you mean like what our de funding decisions will be based on? Yeah, I mean, how are you evaluating uh, uh, the codes for, I, I assume it has to do with the housing production, but. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, first, I'll just mention just saying there's there's talks in the legislative session around specifically dedicated pots of funding for code amendments. So I think if you're thinking that you need a code amendment project, like this is the round to be applying for assistance, um, it'd be a good idea. But just so you know how we're making decisions, and this is for all of the projects that we have on board, we essentially have three major criteria. We, we outline them in the grant packet, so take a read of them. But in short, they relate to our top priority, which is statutory compliance. So if a city needs to come into compliance with either a specific law or a set of laws, that is kind of the intended purpose of these grant programs. And that has to be kind of our top priority. So that would be priority number one. And then priorities number two and three can strengthen applications. The second one is that it is uh, uh, the project will provide housing where it's needed the most. So the idea here is that we are trying to maximize the use of these resources to increase housing production, affordability, and choice, especially in smaller and more capacity constrained communities. So to the extent that this project supports that, that will be a major, you know, kind of prioritizing factor. And then the third one is that the project uh, uh, increases kind of uh, fair and equitable housing outcomes, including affirmatively furthering fair housing. So to the extent that, you know, it's 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 considering all those different dimensions of equity and, and is really trying to provide uh, more housing choices for people, especially historically marginalized communities, that will also be kind of an additional priority factor. Um, so just those kind of three criteria are going to be our, our major ones, but we'll be trying to maximize the use of, of these resources as much as we can. So. Great. Thanks, Sean. And I, I realized, Ethan, I, I stepped on Morgan S. I, I didn't realize uh, oh. the other Morgan sent a good. question. Sorry about that. Oh, good. Yeah, Michael, I see your hand, but I'm going to try to address Morgan S.'s question real quick. Um, Morgan S., I think I'm reading your uh, question correctly to say that you're thinking about just kind of doing that preliminary step before a UGB amendment uh, or doing kind of the concept planning work before you have a, G, a UGB amendment in place. And could that be eligible? I would say yes. I, I think that's a that would be definitely an eligible project under kind of that $1 million. Sean seems to say- I would be cautious, different. right? Because that assumes <laughs> that that UGB amendment will be in that location and that decision will not be appealed. So you're kind of like counting your chickens before they hatch. So just consider that as you're, as you're thinking about that. Yeah, fair. More risky than doing it the the way that it's designed to, but yeah. Uh, Michael. Yeah, th thanks, Ethan and Sean. Uh, so I'm looking at the application. I've actually started filling it out. And, uh, you know, based on my conversation with Sean and, and Don uh, a little over a week ago, um, I'm hoping to submit for a, uh, a code analysis uh, housing grant. And so as I'm filling out the application and I'm hoping that you have a consultant that I can check the box so I don't have to go through uh, all of that process and I can ignore the estimated budget. So I'm not just guessing some random number, but as I'm filling out and I'm getting to the, uh, uh, I think it's page four, which has the project criteria. I yeah. think, I think these fields, especially in field for number one on the evaluation criteria, there's I think there's a word limit. I don't know that for sure, oh. but I, I think I've ran into a word limit because um, I'm actually typing it in another document and then I copy and paste it in there and then I'm finding only part of my paste words. And so uh, uh, I'm having a difficult time addressing all of the three criteria in this space. And so, so that was my question uh, is, am I doing something wrong or do, is there a word limit uh, on here that causes me to have to submit a supplemental document just to address this one. I, I see what you're saying. I, I think um, what we'll do, because I see that there's only two lines in there for text, right? Um, we will take a look at that and try to lengthen it and update that link. So it'll be the same link, um, but it'll be a longer field so you can submit it. Of course, if you're hitting up with a word limit, you can always include an attachment saying like, hey, this was just really too limiting and we needed to include this attachment, but we'll try to fix that and update the link um, to get the form to be readily filled out. 
my apologies. I thought this would be dynamic. I thought the PDF would move in like as folks filled out the fields, but I see that, that that's not the case. So uh, we'll fix that. Well, this one, yeah, this one actually, I have four lines in there before it cut me off, and and it just keeps making the text smaller and smaller, and and so uh, you know, so you that's have an ideal. Another, yeah, I have to use another document just to type it because otherwise I can't. I can no longer read the uh, the text I'm typing in, but. Uh, but yeah. anyway, I, I wasn't sure if uh, my copying pasting was the problem or if it was literally a limit of the field. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for raising that. Yeah, give us a day or two to just update that URL and refresh at that point. You should have a document that's actually uh, going to work for you. But okay, yeah, like you. Sean is saying, if it if it never actually works, then a supplemental document with your with your application is totally fine too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eunice had Sorry a question in that. the chat about, yeah, apologies. Eunice had a question in the chat about city manager versus uh, council approval or kind of thumbs up. So the requirement that we have for our procurement and contracting is that the city council has a signed letter resolution that they are uh, supporting the project. So that needs to take place at the time where we get into kind of the negotiation phase, which calendar wise maybe puts us like September ish. Um, so that is uh, something that we'll definitely need uh, as part of the final inking of the contract and the grant agreement. And I'll add, council. I'll add, we're not trying to just add process here. It's actually very important because there are times where if a city council doesn't support a project, but we've dedicated funding for that project, it, it's kind of like lighting money on fire. Um, so it's very important that we make sure that the council is actually behind the project um, before we fund it. Right. Michael, I saw your hand pop back up. Yeah, well, I just had to follow up to this particular item. Uh, we, we do this as a standard practice, not so much as a resolution, but... Uh, all of our departments, when we apply for grants, uh, we require uh, council support. But uh, uh, typically what we do is our council will make a motion and then we have a letter that the mayor signs. Is, is that acceptable or do you need a resolution? Um, actually, you know what, that should be fine. As, as we just need a, a, an official document from a, um, like, like a public official representing the city indicating support of the project. It doesn't need to be a resolution. Okay, okay perfect, thank you. And that I think addresses Brandon's question in the chat as well. If yeah, it doesn't, Brandon, please let us know. Yeah, don't care so much about the format, but we do need to make sure, because we have had instances, even this biennium where like staff and council turned over and they turned out to not be in support of the project. And that was money that we could have spent on folks who had councils who supported projects. So we want to avoid that. Any other questions that folks have? All right, we've got a question. Give us give us a second to read this question here, Jamin. We can read it out. I can read it out loud for the folks. Okay, yeah, go, go for it. I see that the materials discourage cities from applying for a housing capacity analysis due to pending rule changes. Does that recommendation apply to smaller cities less than 10,000 in population, not $10,000, that are not subject to statutory HCA requirements, or will those cities be required to prepare an HCA under new rules? So just something to address here, smaller cities are actually subject to statutory requirements on housing capacity analyses. They're, they're still subject to goal 10. They're just not subject to the same uh, schedule that cities above 10,000 are, right? So the requirement to do it once every eight years for cities outside of the metro, that wouldn't apply to small cities in particular. But the ONA policy, House Bill 2001 that passed, applies to all cities. All cities are going to be responding to allocations that are produced by the state. The problem is those numbers will not be published until January 1st of 2025, which you can imagine if you're doing a housing capacity analysis, that's gonna make it very difficult because you won't know what the need side of the equation is until January 1st, of 2025. So we wanna avoid a situation in which a city is in a, uh, a position where they have an HCA that they have under the old rules, but they you know, essentially are 
have de developed a, a document that is not consistent with statute, right? Because that wouldn't be defensible, say, for example, if somebody appealed the document, if it was used as the basis for a UGB amendment, and we want to avoid that outcome. It just creates a lot of conflicts and headaches. Obviously, there's a lot of kind of exceptions and, and considerations to the rules. We highly recommend just reaching out to us to talk through specific, you know, kind of questions. But generally speaking, if you haven't started a housing capacity analysis yet, we would no generally recommend waiting. Um, and so we we will have uh, kind of conversations as the year progresses with different cities to be like, all right, what's going to work best for your city's context if you're a city above 10,000, but for cities below 10,000, generally speaking, we recommend holding off unless there's an extremely compelling reason. And then we recommend talking to us about it. Okay, let's see. So a couple of questions here. I'm gonna address John's first about the city of Yahat. So you're working on a housing implementation plan still this month. It'll go to council later this summer. Are we still eligible for a DLCD grant under when you say current, I'm assuming this this exact oh, as the next by name kind of going forward uh, round of no. grants. Yeah, I had not. Okay, yeah. So yes, you would be eligible to submit an application and uh, implement that uh, HIP going forward. Yeah, that would be a perfectly acceptable um, project. Perfectly yeah. eligible. Yeah. And, and I will Thanks, just John reinforce that with saying, in particular with code amendment projects, we would highly encourage submitting applications for code amendment projects. We we yeah. don't have certainty yet, but the legislature is talking about allocating a lot of funding for code amendments specifically. So we can't promise anything, but we would encourage right. it. Especially with yeah, what's going on in Salem at this point. Um, Okay, Todd's question. It was my understanding that funds could only be used for consultants, but Ethan mentioned that they could be used for staff time. Please confirm this. Any unique limitations when applying funds for staff time? All right, good question. So there are two branches or two types of grant options that local governments have. They have a kind of what Sean was describing when he had those, those documents up saying, there is a DLCD provided bench of consultants that you can just kind of say, I wanna do a housing production strategy um, and that's our plan. Uh, and you just send that information to DLCD. We then work with a consultant that we have contracted with on the back end and provide the consultant to the city to do that work. That city doesn't have to do any kind of contract management administration. We do all of that in the background. Uh, and you as a local government are kind of just working on the actual project itself rather than the grant. There's also another option, which is the direct grant uh, option, which would allow a city to receive funding from DLCD to run their own procurement process to get their own consultant, um, or they could hire additional staff to do that project, do that work, and that direct grant funding could be used for both for either of those. Go through your own procurement process, hire your own staff to do it. Um, so both of those are, are opportunities. Either DLCD provides the consultant or DLCD provides the funding. Those are the kind of two paths. Does that answer your question, Todd? Okay, yes. Awesome. All right, other questions we've got. I don't see any others in the chat. And if folks want to talk about like the projects that they're thinking about and, and you know any considerations they're in, we're happy to chat through those two, those questions. Good question, okay. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. Expected award date. So I see Kelly, you entered into the chat and then we had Michael after. Um, actually, let's let's take this as an opportunity to just talk through the timeline more generally. Um, you'll see this in both the uh, grant application packet as well as on the form. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly, um, but we wanted to make sure you had a clear timeline of like what's gonna be happening when. Um, and this will be important because we also need to know your timelines for like when you expect different project milestones to be, like when you expect different tasks to take place. Um, but so you know, you know, we released the materials on June 1st, 2023. We wanted to provide two months for folks to complete the applications, right? Um, to, you know, make sure they have sufficient time. 
obviously today is June 5th and we're having this follow-up question and answer session. The applications are gonna be due on July 31st of 2023. And then we're gonna take a month to review them to make kind of grant and, and funding decisions. And we'll release the results of that. We'll, we'll publish results on September 1st. Um, and then once we publish those results, then we have to go into contracting. We have to actually make agreements with cities who are receiving direct grants. And we have to kind of hash out contract details with the bench of consultants that we have selected from the RFP process, assuming DAS ever um, gives us that delegation request, but we won't talk about that right now. But we expect that to take some time. And something to keep in mind as you're going through this, grant agreements are generally faster than DLCD provided consultants to get to an executed agreement. We would expect these agreements to be, you know, depending on the factors that go into refinement, anywhere between like October to November to execute those grant agreements. And then for DLCD provided consultants, it's going to take a little bit longer. We're going to be shooting for November to December, but in the last biennium, we didn't have contracts executed and projects rolling until like January. So just keep that in mind as you're filling out the timelines. And then the projects need to conclude, we ask that they conclude by May 31st of 2025. The reason that we do that is because at the end of the biennium, June 30th of 2025, that funding is no longer available. We cannot spend it anymore. Um, it, it goes poof, is, is uh, to say it another way. But to ensure that we have enough time to process invoices, we ask that folks conclude these projects no later than May 31st of 2025. Um, so just keep those timelines in mind as you're filling out this application. Thanks, Sean. There's a, Michael, before we go to you, there's a question from Scott in the chat about uh, whether the city can apply for projects already in motion. So um, those, oh, pro any, yeah. Um, Ethan, we, we skipped over Michael. Oh, I was just going to uh, answer Scott's question real quick and then go to Michael. Okay. Sorry. Um, so projects already in motion. So I would say um, any of the work that has already been completed on that particular project can't be back funded. Uh, so the opportunity would be to say, hey, we're going to enter into this next phase of this project and here's our scope of work and all that kind of stuff. But we can't kind of retroactively fund any of that work. So it would be all future work to be done. Um, and then your question about a specific uh, UGB amendment, councils uh, hasn't decided whether they want to go forward yet. Should we still apply? I would say yes. Uh, I think that work is something that you can fund. It's You have funding available in this upcoming biennium to do UGB amendment work. So I would say apply if you don't get to the point when uh, we really do need to have that kind of approval by council kind of in September timeframe then we can address that at that point. But I would say get the application in now just to be prepared for that. Uh, but Michael. Oh, thank you. So, so my, I have actually two questions. Uh, these kind of go back more as a follow-up to my conversation with Sean and Don a couple weeks ago, but, uh, and maybe others would be interested in the same scenario. But this grant, since it's focusing on housing, my hope is, is that the consultant will uh, be able, since I'm looking at a code analysis, the consultant will be able to look at non-residential related items and help with recommendations on code amendments. Uh, one, for example, that I have that's been on uh, my council's list for probably three or four years, and I keep kicking the can down the road because of all the, the housing needs analysis and production studies doing my sign code. And, uh, and I, been avoiding that for for a number of reasons, but uh, but I'd like a consultant to do that. And uh, based on our conversation a couple of weeks ago, um, I may be able to include that. Um, and so I guess my first question, uh, maybe for the whole group's benefit, is uh, is how is that is that eligible, and and how do you include that in the grant request as I fill out my narrative? And then the second question that I have related to that is. Uh, with a DLCD hired consultant, uh, I don't know if they have specific qualifications, but if they're not qualified to do the sign code or I don't get support for for adding that to uh, this grant, um, would uh, would you just weed that out of my narrative and say, well, we'll fund the housing piece, but not the sign code piece. And, and so that I, I don't disqualify myself just for asking. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question. And what I'll add, what I'll say is uh, first, 
definitely include everything that you want on an application and we can we can tell you no essentially for for different parts but it won't necessarily be an entire project we've done this in the last biennium where you know a city might have asked for a lot of different things but we needed to make you know priority decisions so we're like well we can do these things but not not these other parts right so we can definitely do that um we we do we should mention our statutory direction here is saying these are four things that are related to housing so we want to make sure it has a nexus there like we probably can't revamp somebody's commercial code that's not really related to housing but we could say like you know if there's a nexus between signed code and residential uses which there can be right you know if we have the funding to kind of support it we want to be able to support as much planning work as we can and it makes sense to kind of pair it with the project um but you know we do have to make those decisions like if we are limited on resources we might need to shed some of the less more critical pieces right so yes, we encourage applying for anything that has a nexus to housing, and we can make the decisions later on saying, all right, well, we have to make focused decisions on what we what we can and can't fund. Does that, does that get at your question? Great. I'll also add that there's, um, I don't know, I'm gonna use synergy between the grant applications at DLCD where um, typically what we've done in the past is through the general technical assistance and which before all this housing funding, the only funding opportunity, grant funding opportunity at DLCD or, or one of the very few ones um, and kind of shifting and playing around with which pot of funding the uh, the project kind of is funded through. So I would say in an instance like that, if, if we were to say uh, that maybe that sign code doesn't really fit in the housing work, we'll fund all of the housing work through the housing fund. And then the other work will try to fund through the general uh, technical assistance fund. And you don't really see that as the city, um, but we would just kind of manage it that way. So um, like Sean is saying, I would encourage the city to ask for all of the things that it needs to do. And we'll try to figure out how to best fund that uh, in the way that makes the most sense for those pots of funding. But Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this may be a stupid question, but I'm always happy to answer, ask stupid questions. Um, are you evaluating these applications as they're coming in? And is there priority given to like kind of first come first serve? Um, and the reason I ask that is where I go with housing in my code is um, I'm at the mercy of what's going on at the legislature right now. Um, so if they actually are able to have some things pass, then um, I'd be looking at clear and objective standards commensurate with uh, 3197. But if they don't, then I'll be going in a different direction with my code. No, that's a good question. And yeah, so the timing is we we do the timing before the legislative session resolve like ends for the purpose of giving cities as much time, cities and counties as much time to be able to, you know, submit grant applications and we can review them and get started with projects as soon as possible. One of the kind of trade-offs with doing that is that we don't know exactly what the session holds until signee die, right? Or even maybe in this case after signee die. And so um uh it's not the way we're structuring the application is it's not first come first serve we do have an application deadline of July 31st of this year and we'll be considering all the applications submitted to that point. Um, and you know we'll probably be reviewing and reading applications beforehand, so we you know know what's coming in we know what to expect but we're not going to say first come first serve. Um, it's it's you know anybody who submits an application by the deadline and meets the criteria would be just as eligible as anybody else. Yeah, and our our priority scheme is first the first bite at the apple is anybody who's trying to fulfill statutory requirements. So, you know, compliance with thirty one ninety seven would fit that bill as the first priority kind of um, within that realm. Okay, what are the questions we have from folks? Might be it. Mari, Thea, anything to add? Okay. Um, maybe we uh, go, th I'm, Sean, you already went through the next steps uh, in terms of like timeline, but maybe it's a good refresher just for the record. Do that one more time. And then I actually forgot to give one more update. So I'll do that right before we close out. But Sean, if you could do the recap one more time. 
the recap of um i'm sorry I, kind of time timeline decision oh yeah dates yeah great yeah so um as as discussed and i showed there's there's all of this materials like it's in the grant materials please give it a review um as you're kind of developing your application um we include major milestones in there uh so the grant application as we discussed is on july 31st of, of this year um we'll be issuing a decision on those those applications a month from from then on september 1st 2023 and then from there we'll be kind of inking grant agreements and contracts with folks and we expect those to you know be adopted and implemented anywhere kind of between october and january it depends on a lot of factors as to how long it takes um and then we have essentially kind of a year and a half to do the projects before they need to close out on uh, by may 31st of 2025 um and that is kind of the timeline again there's there's a lot more detail and information in the grant uh, agreement or sorry the grant application materials uh, we highly encourage just taking a review of that and making sure that these projects look like you know roughly what you need um, and then fill up that application. And again, if you're you know generally proposing kind of a standard project type like a code amendment project or a housing production strategy or something like that, it it really, you know, the details aren't as important. We just need to know that you're doing that project type. So you don't need to submit a detailed work program. Though if you are doing the custom bespoke project, we do ask for for more details on that. So um, but yeah, with that, I think that is everything. Hopefully you guys find this easier this round than in the previous biennial. I know we had to do work programs for everybody, which could be a little bit of, of, of a pain, especially if you're just doing a very simple project. All right. Well, I think with that, I'll bounce it back to Ethan and I'll stop recording. If you want this, this recording or, or have any additional questions, please reach out to us. We're happy to provide this on request. But thank you guys.